Hello and test hello everyone. Welcome to class 12 biology. In this video, we will discuss about DNA replication. In your class 11 cell biology chapter, uh, when you studied about cell division, mitosis and meiosis, you must have studied that there are many phases. And in one of the phases, there is a phase called S phase or the synthesis phase. Uh, so during S phase, what happens is there is a replication of the DNA. That means DNA creates copies of itself. Right. So you must have studied that in class 11. So in this video, we will discuss about the DNA replication mechanism and then we will see the DNA replication process in detail. So DNA replication mechanism, right? So the DNA replication mechanism is said to be semi-conservative. So you have to remember this particular word, semi-conservative DNA replication mechanism. This DNA replication mechanism was proposed by Watson and Crick, the same two people who proposed uh, the double helical model for DNA structure. So when they proposed the DNA double helical model, they observed that adenine pairs with thymine, guanine pairs with cytosine, and that particular specific base pairing gave them the idea that the DNA replication mechanism will be semi-conservative in nature. So what does the semi-conservative DNA replication mechanism mean? It simply means that when the DNA replicates, when an original DNA, when it replicates, what happens is the two DNAs formed, right? The two DNAs, one DNA molecule will give rise to two DNA molecules. Uh, in the two DNA molecules, each will retain one parental DNA strand, and over that parental DNA strand, a new DNA strand will be synthesized. So you can see over here. So this is the original parental DNA. And when it replicates, it becomes two DNA molecules. And if you look in the new uh, two DNA molecules over here, here we have uh, one parental strand. So this pink one represents the parental strand. And over that, a new strand is synthesized. In both of them, you can see that in both the DNA, uh, there is one parental strand and over that, a new DNA strand is synthesized and that particular mechanism is called as semi-conservative DNA replication mechanism. So this was proposed by Watson and Crick. The experimental proof that DNA replicates semi-conservatively, it came in 1958. So in 1958, these two scientists, Matthew Messelson and Franklin Stahl, they performed a certain experiment which proved that DNA replication is semi-conservative in nature. They were working on a specific bacteria called as E. coli. So the full name of E. coli is Escherichia coli. So you have to remember the name of the bacteria. So E. coli is the name of the bacteria. The full form will be Escherichia coli. So these two scientists, Messelson and Stahl, they were performing experiments on E. coli. And their experiment proved that DNA replication was semi-conservative in nature. Let's look at their experiment in detail. So Messelson and Stahl's experiment. This is very important uh, because uh, quite often in board examinations, the question gets asked about, explain Messelson and Stahl's experiment and how it proved that DNA, is a, a DNA replication is semi-conservative in nature. So Messelson and Stahl's experiment, what they did was, in the first step, in the beginning, what they did was they grew E. coli in, E. coli is the bacteria, so E. coli is in a medium containing N15. So this is a heavy isotope of nitrogen. Now remember, I am calling it as heavy isotope, not radioactive isotope. So N15 is the heavy isotope of the nitrogen. And in the first step of the Messelson and Stahl's experiment, E. coli were grown in a medium containing N15 uh, atoms, right? So what that will do is, in the DNA of the E. coli, N15 will be incorporated, right? In all the DNA, in, in the DNA of all the E. coli grew, which grew in this particular medium, will have in their DNA N15. That means the DNA will be heavier. Right? So if you centrifuge the DNA in a cesium chloride density gradient, what you will find is the DNA materials will settle somewhere over here. It is much lower over here. I will show you later on. 
right? So this pink uh, layer represents the DNA layer, where the DNA has settled in the centrifugation cesium chloride gradient, right? So why it is settling down over here is because the DNA is heavy. Because it is heavy because the DNA contains nitrogen and 15, the heavier isotope of the nitrogen. Now in their second step, what they did was they took the E. coli, which grew in N15 medium, then they transferred the E. coli bacteria in a medium containing normal nitrogen, N14, the lighter the lighter one, right? So this is the heavy nitrogen, this is the lighter one, N14. This is, this is the normal nitrogen, right? So the medium containing normal nitrogen in which the E. coli were transferred and they grew that E. coli in that particular medium. And then they extracted the DNA from these E. coli and they centrifuged. When they centrifuged, they found that the DNA of this particular E. coli, which grew in N14 medium, they found, they, they found that the DNA was settling in a layer a little bit above the original one. Right, a little bit above the original one. Why so? Because the DNA has become somewhat lighter. They have become hybrid. Right, so each strand, so this original strand, the pink one, the pink one was containing N15, right? So the pink DNA strand was containing 15 and it is the heavier nitrogen. Now in the new, in the new strands over here, the new strands, it contains N14, the blue ones, it contains N14 because they were, they were grown in this particular medium. So the DNA, which were newly synthesized, they were synthesized by using N14. So this one will be lighter in nature. This, this one will be lighter, right? So when, when the DNA was centrifuged in cesium chloride gradient, the DNA settled a little bit above the original layer because it has become a little bit lighter. Now if you continue, if you continue to uh, replicate or if you continue to grow the E. coli over here, so if you continue to grow the E. coli, you find that now there is a formation of two layers. When you centrifuge the E. coli which was grown again in the same medium and which, containing, uh, which was containing N14, you find two layers over here. Why it happens is because now the DNA, there are two forms of DNA. One hybrid form which was found in this particular first one and the one which contains DNA in which the, both the strands of the DNA contained N14. Right. So this proves that the DNA replication mechanism is semi-conservative in nature. Right. So over here, the important thing to remember is that N15 is the heavier isotope of the nitrogen, not the radioactive one. And when the DNA contains N15, when both the strands of the DNA contains N15, it is the heavy DNA and it settles somewhere at the bottom of the tube in cesium chloride gradient during centrifugation. And when the same bacteria which grew in this one was allowed to grow in a medium containing N14, what happens is their DNA, when, when they extract the DNA out of that particular bacteria, they found that their DNA was a hybrid form in which one strand contained 15N, the heavy one, and one strand contained 14N. Right? So that becomes a little bit lighter and it forms a layer in the cesium chloride gradient a little bit above the original one. And again, if you grow, let allow the E. coli to grow in the same medium. In the second, after second division, what you will find is the DNA. It forms two layers. One, which is the hybrid form, is the same one over here, the purple one, and then the blue one on the top because this is the DNA which in which the both the strands contain N14. Right. So E. coli. How how can uh, they be sure that it is one replication cycle? Uh, replication cycle number two is that they knew that E. coli, the, in, in E. coli, the cell divides after every 20 minutes. So uh, they waited for 20 minutes. So from here to here, they waited for 20 minutes. And from here to here, they waited for another 20 minutes. Right. So that is how they performed the experiment. And through this experiment, they were able to prove that the DNA replication mechanism was semi conservative in nature. So this is the picture provided in your textbook regarding Meselson and Stoll's experiment. You study this particular uh, picture, this diagram, and then you have to be able to explain uh, what Meselson and Stoll did in this particular experiment to prove that DNA replication is 
semi-conservative in nature. And it is not just Messelson and Stahl's experiment which prove that DNA, is semi DNA replication is semi-conservative in nature. There are other people who worked with other organisms, not just E. coli, uh, like Taylor and his colleagues. Uh, they worked with uh, plants called Vixia faba, uh, Vixia faba, which is a faba beans. And in their experiment, they used that particular plant and they used radioactive thymidine to prove that DNA replication is semi-conservative in nature. So you may want to read about the work of Taylor and colleagues, how they proved that DNA replication is semi-conservative in nature by performing experiments on Vixia faba. So now let us discuss about the DNA replication process. So how does DNA replication happen? Right. So DNA replication, it happens semi-conservatively, I have already told you. In this particular process, many enzymes are required along with the substrate. So the substrate will be deoxyribonucleotides. Right. So en many enzymes will be required as well as there will be a requirement of the substrates which are deoxyribonucleotides. And during replication process, this is the original uh, DNA, this is the original DNA molecule, the double-stranded DNA molecule. During the replication process, the double-stranded, so these are the two strands, so the double-stranded uh, DNA, they should be separated, right, they should be separated to create a replication fork, right, it creates a replication fork. So do, what it means is, the hydrogen bonds present between the basis of the two strands will be broken down. Right. So the hydrogen bonds will be broken down and the two strands will be separated to form two single-stranded DNAs. Right. And these two will act as template uh, DNA strand over which the new DNA strand will be synthesized by polymerizing nucleotides. Right. The, by polymerizing, by adding one nucleotide after the, after the other, the new strand will be synthesized on these two templates. Right. So many enzymes are required, like I said, and along with that, the raw materials or the substrate deoxyribonucleotides are also required for the formation of two new strands. So for the replication purpose in your textbook one major DNA, uh, uh, one major enzyme is highlighted for the replication process that is DNA dependent DNA polymerase. So it is said to be DNA dependent DNA polymerase because first of all it polymerizes DNA it creates a new, new strand of DNA by polymerizing uh, deoxyribonucleotides. And it is said to be DNA dependent because uh, in order to create a new strand, it requires a one old DNA strand as a template. So that is why it is said to be DNA dependent DNA polymerase. So the property of this DNA dependent DNA polymerase is that it is highly efficient and it is highly accurate. Right? It has to be accurate because it has to avoid creating any unnecessary mutations or harmful mutations. Right? If there is some error in DNA copying mechanism, what will happen? Uh, mutations will occur and that mutation may, may prove harmful for the organism. So therefore, it has to be highly accurate. It is highly efficient because it can polymerize about 2000 base pairs per second. So this particular number, 2000 base pairs per second, the polymerization of about 2000 base pairs per second is derived from how E. coli divides in every 20 minutes, right? So from that one, by counting the number of base pairs, the amount of base pairs in the E. coli cell uh, and how fast it divides, they calculated that the DNA polymerase can polymerize up to 2000 base pairs per second. Right? So that is the speed and efficiency of the DNA polymerase enzyme. So this is one of the major enzymes which helps in the replication process. But it has got some drawbacks as well, right? DNA polymerase has got some limitations as well. So what are those limitations? And these limitations are pretty important to understand the replication process later on. DNA polymerase, it can synthesize the new DNA strand in only five prime to three prime direction. Now remember I told you that DNA uh, has got two strands which run in anti-parallel manner and that uh, parallel anti-parallel manner is uh, said to be uh, the orientation is based upon the orientation of the DNA strands. It runs from 5 prime to 3 prime direction in this way and then it uh, other one uh, runs from 5 prime to 3 prime direction in the opposite direction right. So that is called as the polarity of the DNA strands. 
So DNA polymerase, it can synthesize the new DNA in only five prime to three prime direction. Right? It can add, uh, it can add a new nucleotide at the three prime direction, so that the polymerization will move towards the three prime direction from five prime direction. So that is called uh, that is the first limitation. Second limitation is the DNA polymerase cannot initiate replication on its own. So the DNA polymerase it cannot start the DNA replication on its own. It requires some help from other enzymes. So there are other enzymes as well. So DNA polymerase is not the only enzyme which is required for the DNA re replication process. There are other enzymes which help DNA polymerase in synthesizing the new DNA strands. So that is about the DNA polymerase enzyme. So now let us look at the replication process uh, in detail. So during DNA replication process, the hydrogen bond present between the two DNA strands will be broken down by an enzyme called helicase. So helicase enzyme is responsible for creating a replication fork. So this is called replication fork because the two DNA strands, they are separated by enzyme helicase by breaking down the hydrogen between these two and it creates a replication fork in which there is creation of uh, two single-stranded DNA which will now act as template strand over which the new DNA strands will be synthesized. So this is a replication fork. In this picture you can see the replication fork over here. The blue one is over here and the yellow one is on the top. Right. And on the blue one and the yellow one, a new DNA strands will be synthesized by the enzyme DNA polymerase. So this enzyme called DNA uh, helicase, the name is not given in your textbook. I'm just telling you for your knowledge. Uh, DNA helicase, it creates replication fork. As the DNA helicase moves towards that direction, the replication fork also moves towards that particular direction. And now I told you that we have got two template strands. On these two template strands, the new, new DNA uh, strand will be synthesized by the enzyme DNA polymerase. Now, these two template strands, on these two template strands, the new DNA strands are not created or polymerized in the same manner. Why? Because, like I, like I, like I told you before, there is a limitation for the DNA polymerase. The DNA polymerase can synthesize the new DNA in only 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Now if you look over here, this is the DNA polymerase. The DNA polymerase, it creates uh, the, DNA, the new DNA strand in a continuous manner on this particular template strand, whereas on this particular template strand, that the same DNA polymerase, it creates the new DNA uh, strands in small, small fragments. These small, small fragments were discovered by a Japanese scientist called Okazaki, and therefore these fragments are also called as Okazaki fragments. Now I told you the reason why, uh, why it happens. Over here, the enzyme DNA polymerase, it has to move in five prime to three prime direction along with the direction in which the replication fork is moving. So therefore it can create the DNA, new DNA strand in a continuous manner without breaking it into fragments. Now for this particular case, this particular DNA, new DNA, the DNA polymerase, the same DNA polymerase, it has to move in the direction opposite to the replication fork. Therefore, it has to create the DNA, new DNA strand in small, small fragments called as Okazaki fragments. And therefore, this is called as the leading strand, right? This new DNA strand is called as the leading strand, and this new DNA strand is called as the lagging strand. It, why it is called as lagging strand? Because the DNA polymerase has to wait for the replication fork to move a little bit up so that it can create a new DNA strand, uh, a new DNA strand fragment uh, for this particular template, the lower template. So the polarity also matters, the polarity of the DNA molecules matters, as well as the limitation of the DNA polymerase that it has to move, it has to synthesize, it can synthesize the new DNA strand in only five prime to three prime direction also matters in DNA replication process. So if, if this particular picture is complicated, you can use the picture given in your textbook. This is the same thing over here. So this is the original strand. This is the original DNA uh, parental strands in which the helicase enzyme will break down the hydrogen bond present between them. It will create a replication fork. And after the replication fork is created, th these are the two template strands. And on the template strand, the template strand which is running from three prime direction to five prime direction over here, the 
polymerase the dna polymerase will synthesize the new dna in a continuous manner right so therefore this is called as the leading strand but on the template strand in which uh, the DNA strand is running uh, 5 prime to 3 prime direction in this direction the DNA polymerase enzyme will synthesize the new DNA in small small fragments called as Okazaki fragments and this is also called as uh, lagging strand because these are synthesized in discontinuous manner and are, are synthesized in small small fragments called as Okazaki fragments these Okazaki fragments are later on joined together and made continuous DNA strand by another enzyme called ligase, DNA ligase. A DNA ligase enzyme, it will join these Okazaki fragments so that they become continuous. So that uh, Okazaki fragments, they become a continuous DNA strand. And uh, this is done by the DNA ligase enzyme. So now I have told you two DNA, uh, two poly uh, enzymes, DNA polymerase and DNA ligase. So this particular picture is also very important and this is the replication process and now after explaining in many words uh, the replication process if it is not clear I will attach a small video along with this particular video uh, which I have uh, copied from the YouTube there is a beautiful animation about DNA replication which will uh, I will attach in the next slide all right so let's play the video and let's try to understand how the replication process occurs DNA is a molecule made up of two strands, twisted around each other in a double helix shape. Each strand is made up of a sequence of four chemical bases, represented by the letters A, C, G and T. The two strands are complementary. This means that wherever there's a T in one strand, there will be an A in the opposite strand, and wherever there's a C, there will be a G in the other strand. Each strand has a 5' prime end and a 3' prime end. The two strands run in opposite directions. This determines how each strand of DNA is replicated. The first step in DNA replication is to separate the two strands. This unzipping is done by an enzyme called helicase and results in the formation of a replication fork. The separated strands each provide a template for creating a new strand of DNA. An enzyme called primase starts the process. This enzyme makes a small piece of RNA called a primer. This marks the starting point for the construction of the new strand of DNA. An enzyme called DNA polymerase binds to the primer and will make the new strand of DNA. DNA polymerase can only add DNA bases in one direction, from the five prime end to the three prime end. One of the new strands of DNA, the leading strand, is made continuously, the DNA polymerase adding bases one by one in the five prime to three prime direction. The other strand, the lagging strand, cannot be made in this continuous way because it runs in the opposite direction. The DNA polymerase can therefore only make this strand in a series of small chunks called Okazaki fragments. Each fragment is started with an RNA primer. DNA polymerase then adds a short row of DNA bases in the five prime to three prime direction. The next primer is then added further down the lagging strand. Another Okazaki fragment is then made and the process is repeated again. Once the new DNA has been made, the enzyme exonuclease removes all the RNA primers from both strands of DNA. Another DNA polymerase enzyme then fills in the gaps that are left behind with DNA. Finally, the enzyme DNA ligase seals up the fragments of DNA in both strands to form a continuous double strand. DNA replication is described as semi-conservative because each DNA molecule is made up of one old, conserved strand of DNA and one new one.
So that is the animation video about the DNA replication process. I hope you understood that. Uh, if you want to watch only that particular portion, the animation portion, you can go to YouTube and try to find out uh, the channel. I forgot the channel name, but you can search for DNA replication process in 3D or animation. You, if you search, you will find that video. It's a very beautiful animation about DNA replication process and it will help you in strengthening your knowledge about the process of DNA replication. Now, the next video will be about transcription, how RNA is created uh, from DNA, how the information moves from DNA to RNA. That is called as transcription. So, the next video will be about that. I hope you read about transcription before you watch the next video. Thank you.